Mr. Chairman, the Articles of Confederation now resolve this convention. The national government ought to be established and sent to this constitution. Welcome back for Lesson 9, Article 3, the Federal Judiciary. Under the Articles of Confederation, the Founders hoped all disputes could be solved in the state courts. Therefore, no federal court system was provided. It soon became apparent, however, that a higher court system was essential. Now, in the Constitution, there are 11 types of cases that are provided for the Supreme and federal courts. Now, remember, 20 powers for Congress, 6 powers for the President, 11 types of cases uh, with the Supreme Court and federal courts. And so here are those cases. Letter A, cases involving the meaning or application of the Constitution. Now originally uh, in the Constitution it doesn't give the, the Supreme Court the authority uh, to do what they call judicial review, which means that the courts really don't have the authority to take a bill and say this is constitutional or unconstitutional. They can only interpret it uh, based on the Constitution. But right early on with Mulberry versus Madison, so this is when James Madison was Secretary of State, um, the Supreme Court usurped this authority and uh, went far beyond just simply uh, looking at the meaning and application of the Constitution and actually began striking things down, stating that they're unconstitutional. So that is not authority that the, that the courts do have. Um, letter B, cases arising under the laws passed by Congress. Cases involving disputes between the United States and foreign powers. Letter D, cases affecting ambassadors or other officials of foreign governments. And E, cases relating to the admiralty of maritime problems. Cases in which the United States is a party. Letter G, disputes between two or more straight states. And letter H, disputes in which the citizen of one state sues another state. Now, this was repealed by the 11th, 11th is your blank there, amendment. Um, at this point, that 11th amendment doesn't really uh, have any uh, purpose anymore because what happened was the, the first state that began, that was uh, being sued was the state of Georgia. And the state of Georgia hadn't given consent uh, to being sued. And so they're like, you know, we're a sovereign state and we haven't agreed that this person can sue us. Well, all states have now agreed that if an individual brings them to federal court, that, uh, that they agree that, that they'll allow that to happen. So that's why that's kind of a moot point at this point. But the 11th Amendment did change that. <clears throat> Letter I, disputes between citizens of different states. And Congress later added the provision that such cases had to be of some importance involving $10,000 or more. 10000 is your blank. Disputes be between citizens of the same state over claims or land grants in different states and cases involving suits between a state or citizen of a, of a state and a foreign government or citizen of a foreign government. So you see, everything that's listed here are all the external things, right? Have to, having to do with the relationship between states primarily. And the only time it's mentioning citizens is if it's a citizen from one state wanting to sue um, uh, another state or two citizens from each state's having to kind of deal with things in federal court. So it's all external stuff, no internal. So none of this stuff where the Supreme Court goes right down to the state and tells the state government. Uh, in fact, in Arizona, we've had some things quite often where the federal courts will say, hey, your state constitution says this, and we're going to interpret it this way, and so therefore you need to write your laws based on this, and we're going to hold you accountable if you don't. The Supreme Court has never given the authority to come in and interpret state uh, constitutions or state laws. Uh, they can only do that based on uh, the federal law, federal constitution. And Section 2, Clause 3, provides that all federal criminal cases, uh, the trial shall be by jury. Jury is your uh, blank there. And the Seventh Amendment also provided for a jury in civil suits where the amount is in excess of $20. $20. Now, this, I want to draw your attention to the, that next paragraph there at the bottom of page 41. It is interesting that the jury referred to here was the common law jury, which would decide on the law as well as find the facts. In 1895, the Supreme Court excluded the jury from determining the law and thereby greatly weakened one of the safety nets the founders had provided to the protection of the rights of the people. Let me kind of explain this a little bit. 
initially, when the uh, courts first uh, began, right when the Constitution took effect, in fact, the very first jury case that was overseen by the Supreme Court, you know the Supreme Court used to oversee jury cases, um, it was John Jay, who was the Supreme Court Justice, he told the jury, gave them instructions, and he said, uh, ladies, well, I didn't say ladies and gentlemen of the jury. He said gentlemen of the jury. So ladies didn't sit on juries at that time. He said gentlemen of the jury. And basically he goes on to explain. He says, you ha now have all of the facts. And it's up to you to basically decide on the facts. And he said, it's also up to you to decide on the law. He said, let me explain to you a little bit about the law. And I hope that you will uh, pay attention to the court's opinion because, uh, you know, we have some experience with the law. But he went on to tell them they don't have to listen to the court's opinion. And so the jury is able to not only take the facts and say, is the person guilty or not guilty, but a jury is also able to look at the law and say, is that law good? Should it apply in this situation? Is it constitutional? Do, do we think it's a just law or an unjust law? If the jury thinks that that law is unconstitutional, even if that person's guilty, they can come back with a not guilty verdict. And juries still have that power. And here where it says in uh, 1895, the Supreme Court excluded the jury from determining the law. They only excluded that by simply the instructions that the jury gets. The jury can still sit down when they deliberate. They can still sit there and say, you know, that law is unjust, unconstitutional, shouldn't even exist, not guilty. This is called jury nullification. And that law still exists, or the, that authority or that right still exists. You see how the founders realized that... Uh, that the last safety net should be the people. We are the last check and balance against unconstitutional or tyrannical laws. We can also even determine, well, that's a good law, but we don't think it should apply here. Or this particular individual, you know, because of some kind of extenuating circumstances, shouldn't uh, be held accountable for what they did because, you know, whatever, for whatever reason. And see, if a jury does that, a judge cannot overturn a not guilty verdict. He can overturn a guilty verdict, if the judge sees that that, that that jury was extremely biased and that that jury um, just totally ignored the whole case, then the judge can say, no, 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 that, I'm going to overturn that. But he cannot overturn a not guilty verdict. So you still have that authority. Um, now, the judges and the, and the lawyers and things don't want you to know that you have that authority, and so uh, they probably wouldn't want you to be on their juries uh, if they knew that you understood it, this uh, jury nullification. And so, you see, between those last two lessons on the presidency and this lesson on the Supreme Court, we see that both of these uh, articles are, are very short and concise, and not a whole lot of power was originally designed to be given to those two articles. But you also start seeing the logical progression that the founders had here. We start with Article 1 is the, executive, or the uh, legislative branch, right? Because when you get people together in a society... You had to first figure out how to get along. So you passed some rules or some laws. So that's why you have the legislative branch, Article 1. Article 2 is the executive branch because once those laws are made, then you need somebody to execute those laws. And then sure enough, what happens after those laws have been executed? We're going to have some disagreements. We're going to have some people that are going to ignore some of those laws, and so therefore we have the judiciary as Article 3. You see the logical progression that the founders put in place here? Question? In section one, it says the judges of the Supreme and Inferior Courts shall hold their offices during good behavior. Who determines what good behavior is? Um, Congress. That's part of the, uh, the impeachment authority. And so the impeachment starts first with the House. Okay? The, con the House has, has the sole authority for, for impeachment. And the reason why that would be is because it's the people's house, right? And so p impeachment usually is going to be a, a political thing, and, and you want to make sure that it's a big enough issue that the public as a whole kind of rises up and says, we, we think this person needs to be impeached. And once that happens, the House determines that. Now, the House determines impeachment based on, you know, like high crimes and misdemeanors, for example. Now, misdemeanors back then was not a criminal term. It didn't mean that you had to break the law. So, for example, when President uh, Clinton was being impeached, a lot of people said, well, you know, what he did, he didn't break the law, so he didn't commit a misdemeanor. Well, a misdemeanor back then simply meant bad behavior. So if Congress, if the President showed up to give the State of the Union speech in jeans and a T-shirt, 
and Congress said that was bad behavior or a misdemeanor, they could impeach him for it. And so then once he's impeached in the House, then it's the power of the Senate to trial impeachments. And all that means, all the authority that the Senate has is yes or no. Did he wear jeans and a t-shirt or did he not? They do not have the authority to determine whether or not it's impeachable. They can only determine yes or no, which is an interesting thing because, again, back with uh, Bill Clinton's impeachment, you had a lot of senators that said that, yes, I do believe that he's guilty of what he's been charged for, but I do not believe that it rises to the level of impeachment, so therefore I'm voting no. The House should have been just hopping mad about that because they absolutely usurped the authority of the House. The Senate only had the authority to say, did he do what they accused him of or did he not? And so when you had these senators flat out saying, yes, he did, but I'm voting no, that was an absolute dereliction of duty. And the House should have been upset about it because that was a usurpation. So that's basically what it means uh, but during good behavior is, uh, is if those judges, uh, if Congress deems that they've had bad behavior for any reason. There was a judge, a federal court judge that was impeached simply because of pub public drunkenness. Um, he was just drunk on the streets as in 1800s, drunk on the streets, and Congress thought, you know, that is, that's impeachable. And so they impeached him, and that was legitimate. So they, they can do it for really any reason. The House is elected, Senate's elected, President's elected, but judges are appointed, and it's for life. Has that, has that always been the case? And if so, why do you think that they set it up that way? It is always the case, and the reason why they did that is because you want that court to be as separate from the people as possible. You want that court to, to make their decisions hopefully based on law, not based on politics or popular opinion. You see, the brilliance of a republic, especially our republic, is we have laws that are passed by the majority of the people, so it's majority rule. But the reason why we have those laws is to protect the minority, right? And so when it comes to, to, uh, to judging on those laws, you don't want majority rule involved because it's there to protect the minority. And so you, you don't want those judges to ever have to answer back to anybody. I was watching an interview uh, not too long ago with uh, Justice Scalia, and he's a great constitutionalist. And, uh, but when he's in this interview, he was just as arrogant as can be. And when the interviewer is asking, well, well how can you do this? Well, because I'm a Supreme Court justice, I can do that. He, he, and he was pretty arrogant about it. And I didn't take offense to that at all, because that's exactly the purpose. You want it so that those Supreme Court judges just have nobody to answer to. So hopefully they stay answering to the law. They don't have to worry about reappointment by the president. They don't have to worry about re-election by the people, you see. So that's exactly why it's a lifetime position. Um, and, and we don't actually elect some of those other, we originally didn't elect some of those other positions that you're talking about. The only federal position that the people elected uh, in the original structure of the Constitution is the House of Representatives. Uh, we did not elect our president, we still don't technically, it goes through the Electoral College, and we did not, did not elect our senators. Um, those were appointed by state legislatures, which we'll go into a little bit more detail with that in the 17th Amendment. Um, so that's why they were, they were lifetime is to keep them separate, um, which is very wise. So, Well, that concludes our lesson on the federal judiciary.